and welcome to this webinar hosted by Jen. Our topic for today is AAV Workflows, Streamlining Processes and Characterization. Today's webinar is sponsored by Unchained Labs. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Uduak Thomas, Senior Editor with Jen, and I'm delighted to be your host for today's webinar. We have three speakers lined up for you today. You'll hear from Dr. Tatiana Nanda, Head of Process Development, Cell Therapy, Drug Product, and Process Analytics at the Center for Breakthrough Medicines, Dr. Lynn Isopi, Director of Drug Product Development at the Center for Breakthrough Medicines, and you'll also hear a brief presentation from Dr. Kevin Lance, Director of Viral Vector Marketing at Unchained Labs. Before we get to their presentations, let's go over some background on our topic. Adeno-associated viruses are effective vectors for delivering novel gene therapies that are developed for various indications. However, the current workflow used to make AAVs needs some work to enable scientists work faster, easier, and at scale. So in this webinar, our speakers will discuss effective solutions for efficient AAV workflows that optimize formulations and simplify manufacturing processes. They will introduce tools from Unchained Labs portfolio that are used for AAV preparation, processing, and analytics. Specifically, you'll hear about Big Tuna, a high throughput, small volume buffer exchange platform that exchanges and concentrates samples for pre-formulation screening. You'll also hear about Stunner, which captures and provides analytics on AAV samples and Junior, a configurable benchtop automation platform for processes like thermal stressing, shaking, freeze thaw, and reformatting. Our speakers will also demonstrate how the Center for Breakthrough Medicines has used Unchained Labs tools for early AAV characterization and pre-formulation studies. Before we get things started, a reminder that we'd love to take your questions following our presentations today. At any time during the presentations, you can enter your questions in the Ask a Question panel on your screen. All right, let's go ahead and get things started. Kevin, the floor is yours. Thank you for that introduction. And thanks for attending uh, our talk today on early characterization and pre-formulation studies to optimize AAV production. I don't know about you, but I've accidentally set off smoke detectors in my kitchen a bunch of times. Um, but that's a good thing because smoke detectors alert you to an issue that's easy to miss. So you can take care of it before it becomes a real problem. The workflows we'll be looking at today do the same thing. That is, alert you to problems that are easy to miss and do it early on. But for formulation development and screening on AEV, instead of smoke from you know bacon being burned. For AAV, screening for only the best formulation is a key part of producing the most stable drug. And for that, we need the ability to get the AAV into the formulations we want to test, the ability to stress out that AAV, and then the ability to see what happens. So the workflow being looked at today uh, starts first off with formulation design of a screen like that, and then goes into exactly what I said, the sample prep, the buffer exchange, getting the AAV into the formulations that we need to screen, so for that, I'll be introducing the Big Tuna, and then the Center for Breakthrough Medicines will discuss how they're using that in their workflows. And then likewise, I'll go into the automated stress uh, capabilities of the Junior platform and the analytic platform uh, of the analytic capabilities of Stunner. So first, let's take a look at Big Tuna. So when it comes to buffer exchange, manual methods just don't cut it. Dialysis is slow and you end up with a sample that's diluted. Uh, centrifugation is faster, but if you concentrate your sample at the membrane as you spin it down, you can end up with the clogging your membrane and end up with aggregation problems. And TFF, tangential flow filtration, is complicated, takes a while to set up and uses large volumes. So it's not the easiest method to use when you're trying to screen through lots of different buffers. So that brings us to Big Tuna, uh, which is able to do up to 96 different buffer exchanges using sample volumes as low as 100 microliters and as high as 48 milliliters per sample, uh, and then 
do all of this with only 15 minutes of hands-on time to just set things up and get buffers in the right part of the instrument and get the software ready to go. So all of this allows you to work with a high number of samples, which is appropriate for buffer exchange, and a low volume of samples, uh, which is appropriate for buffer exchange screening for AAV formulation development. The consumable that Big Tuna works on is called an unfilter. It uh, is available in an unfilter 96 and an unfilter 24, which has 96 or 24 wells. And these work with different ranges of volumes and different molecular weight cutoff filters, uh, where there's a regenerated cellulose membrane at the bottom of these unfiltered plates. And that allows you to uh, filter sample through the molecular weight cutoffs of those regenerated membranes and let buffer exchange happen. Uh, and because you're doing this with a high throughput uh, sample number, then you can end up with a low cost per sample. How this works is start with sample in your unfilter. Uh, Big Tuna will measure the volume uh, using a non-contact uh, ultrasonic volume sensor. And then it begins the buffer exchange process where it uses positive pressure to push sample down through the bottom of the membrane but what's key there is it also does this with orbital mixing so that we don't have over concentration at the membrane and everything stays in solution and well mixed at the end of one of those positive pressure cycles the big tuna again measures the volume figures out how much buffer passed through the membrane and then refills with the new buffer you want to go into repeat that cycle until you have the percent exchange that you want, 95, 99, whatever, until you end up you know, with all of the uh, AAV samples that you have into all of the buffers that you want to test out in your formulation screen. And at the end of it, if you want to concentrate your sample up higher, that's uh, an option that you can do as well. So like I said, what the key uh, sort of secret sauce of Big Tuna is, is the, the gentle and efficient exchange that's happening with that positive pressure combined with the orbital mixing. So you don't just have an effect where things are collecting at the membrane. You have an effect where the AAV that you want to keep in solution is well mixed and doesn't start aggregating as your sample concentration gets higher and higher. How Big Tuna does this is you know, on an automated platform where we have a lot of different tools available. First off, you see the ultrasonic volume check for making sure that that non-contact, doing those non-contact reads of volume inside of the unfiltered plate. We have the unfilter itself, and it's sitting inside of the exchange chamber, which closes to provide a positive pressure environment and push those uh, lower molecular weight and solvents through the bottom of the unfiltered plate. We have a six tick tip arm that's responsible for pipetting buffers around the platform and a gripper for moving plates. Okay, so all of that together lets you get through fast formulation screening, where you can take you know, the candidates that you want, let's say four candidates in this situation, uh, the buffers that you want. So here we're showing six different buffers and really start to do that, you know, sort of DOE style buffer exchange and screening uh, with optional concentration at the end to get those drug candidates, those AEVs that you want into all the buffers that you need to screen and get all of this done in a high throughput automated fashion. So that's the sample prep step. Next comes the automated stressing step, which we're gonna be doing on Junior. So Junior is our automation platform that can be fitted out with a lot of different capabilities to make your workflows uh, even more hands-off and high throughput than you have today. So in this case, what we'll be focusing on is a formulation screening platform, but uh, Junior can be outfitted with all sorts of different tools to make what you need done possible. So that can be viscosity, pH measurement, visual inspection, which we'll look at a few of those today. Uh, it can also perform operations on uh, vials like manipulating stop stoppers and crimping, uh, labeling vials, and then can even work with small molecule drugs in a, a pre-formulation setup. So looking at solubility, looking at reactions, or looking at powder dispense. So in a stability workflow, uh, the way that we kind of divide things up is into three different groups, preparing your experiment, uh, conducting that experiment with different processing methods, and analyzing your experimental results. So many of our capabilities are from uh, off-the-shelf functionalities that fit into those different categories. So preparation can be buffer prep, or it can be filtration. Uh, processing can be 
then buffer exchange into those samples. It could be incubation, temperature control, or stressing. Uh, and then analysis can be fitting any of our uh, analytical capabilities to those final prepped samples at the end of it. So on top of all of our integration capabilities to get our analytical tools or processing tools or prep tools integrated to a junior, uh, Unchained Labs can also do custom development for anything that you need. So how do we offer so many different capabilities on one platform? Well, we have automation with modularity. So every system can be configured with those standard modules that have a wide range of capabilities and add custom integrations and design that you need. That helps us deliver systems quicker without sacrificing capabilities that you want in your workflow. So here's one example of what that might look like in an automated stress workflow solution. In this particular case, it has a lot of the modules that we'll look at for later for AAV formulation testing. So starting at the arm, this junior has a six tip liquid dispenser and a vial plate gripper for moving labware around the deck. It has a viz station, uh, which measures turbidity, analyzes color and detects visible particles. And then the remaining modules enable thermal and mechanical stressing. So that gets us to the automated stress part of the formulation screen. Last, we get to the analytics because we have to check and see what all happened during that buffer exchange and stress test. Now, when we get to analytics, uh, I kind of want to start by talking about two techniques. So we have DLS and we have UVViz. Each of them tells a part of the story for AAD characterization. DLS gets you info on caps of titer and aggregation, um, but can't really say anything about what's happening with how much DNA you have in your sample. On the other hand, UVViz gets you total amounts of DNA and protein and can link those to MP-full ratio, but doesn't get you info about if any of this is contained in capsids. So each gets you valuable info, but neither tells you everything. So what if you could combine them into a whole story? Well, that's Stunner. It, Stunner brings those two technologies together to calculate answers on AAV capsid titer, empty full ratio, and aggregation using only two microliters of sample in less than a minute. And it does this using no labels, reagents, or standards. You just use the sample that you've got. So let's dive into how this how it does this pretty briefly. So. Getting data from such a, such a small sample volume starts with Stunner's consumable 96 well plate shown here. In the plate, each well is a microfluidic circuit that lets you use just two microliters of sample to get information from two technologies, UVVIS for concentration and DLS for sizing. SLS intensity data is also read during a DLS experiment. Uh, and this plate can be used to read you know, one sample if you want or all the way up to 96 samples at a time. Stunner's AAV quant application will then combine those, those two pieces of powerful information together into a full story about your AAV. So showing just quickly how those microfluidics work is you know, shown here with a sample of fluorescein that I've added to really make it pop on camera. And you can see how that two microliter sample is drawn into the microfluidics uh, and that was shown in real time. Once it's in those microfluidics and read in the plate, we're gonna get that DLS and UVVIS data coming out of Stunner. So checking out your AAV with DLS tells you what shape your sample is in. If there's only capsids or if aggregates have started to show up as well. So DLS lets you figure out how much SLS intensity is coming just from your AAV capsids, which is the area under the curve shown in green here. So what we want is to understand how much of our signal is coming just from capsids how much is coming from aggregates. We'll use that information on the next slide. On the UVVIS side of things, what's important is that we can take the total amount of absorbance, which is shown in gray, and Stunner software can break that down into the amount of absorbance coming from DNA and the amount of absorbance coming from protein and calculate how much DNA and protein is present in your sample. We're going to, Stunner will use that to calculate percent full. Okay, so what Stunner does is shown step by step here. First, DLS identifies the capsids, the aggregates, and how intense the uh, signal is from each of those populations. So let's say the area under the curve that's green is 70% of the total area. In the middle, that info then helps you split up your SLS signal, which is just an intensity signal, uh, from a total value into the amount that's attributable just from your capsids. So in that case, we could say, oh, maybe 70% of the total area under the curve is coming from your capsids. And finally, UVVIS brings in info about empty full ratio, which is going to be the balance between your protein and your DNA. Uh, 
and then just total amounts of protein and DNA totals. And think of this like how many mg per mil DNA do I have? How many mg per, or mg per mil protein do I have? How many nanogram per micro DNA do I have? These data are then combined in Stunner's AEV quant application automatically to get you to an accurate capsid titer. So how this is done is by understanding first the relationship between capsid titer and SLS intensity. But the way that starting to calculates things is by reading that SLS intensity, which is our green area from capsids here. Let's say that SLS intensity is two times 10 to the negative five. So that SLS intensity uh, can be used to figure out a range of capsid titers that could fill that intensity. But to get down to a single answer, what you actually need is the empty full ratio. So you have to know where in that line you lie based on how full your capsids are. So that's when we combine the SLS and DLS information with the UEVIS information to get to one accurate capsid titer number. So from all of that uh, uh, data, what Stunner is able to understand is the complete titer story. So it understands how many total capsids are there of your AEV, how much excess protein signal is coming from aggregates, and then how many full capsids are present as well as how much excess DNA is there. So all of that is done in a way that uh, correlates really, really well with other comparable techniques. So here I'm showing ELISA. Uh, in this case, Stunner is way faster and requires less upfront work than a AEV9 ELISA, where we've taken full or empty AEV9 and ran a dilution series and compared the two methods. So here we can see Stunner's total capsid titer on the y-axis against the result for that AAV9 caps at ELISA. Uh, the results have sloped close to one and R squared value is above 0.99. And importantly, it would have taken hours to get this ELISA data across all of those samples. Well, Stunner's done it in less than an hour with no sample prep. So with that analytical piece at the end of your workflow, uh, you're able to build a sample prep, stress and analytic a uh, workflow that lets you know exactly what's going on, and you can use this part of a formulation screen and analysis workflow to put out aggregation fires before they start. So now I'll turn it over to Tatiana and Lynn at the Center for Breakthrough Medicines. Thank you, Kevin. Today, Lynn and I want to propose that it is extremely important to gain early understanding on the properties of your drug product including execution of preformulation studies to optimize both stability and production of AAV. So why is it so important to get a good drug product early? Well, as, as many other cases, it is driven by the need of funding. Previously, a lot of companies could afford to wait until phase three and even commercial to pursue IPO. However, in the current environment, majority of biotech is looking to go public early and for that, reaching clin clinical milestones is extremely important. So what can hinder innovator companies from reaching phase one? One of the potential unpleasant surprises is an adequate stability profile of final drug product. Then can manifest itself as aggregation or absorption of drug product and therefore loss of the titer. Also chemical degradation potency can also be encountered resulting in slow process development scale-up challenges, and uh, product inconsistencies. As a combination of all those factors, health authorities may express concern about the dose accuracy uh, in your study and therefore delay the trial. And the cost of delay is high. On average, biotech companies have only 18 months of cash runway, with uh, almost a third actually having only 12, and if we transfer this into monitor number, we're talking about $50,000 on average that costs per day for clinical trial delay. So how can we efficiently and without substantial burning of this cash runway enter clinical trials? Here on, on, on the bottom, you will see a pie chart which shows common requirements for material needed for clinical submissions. And as you can see, about 60% of requirements are for toxicology and leading stability studies. So innovator companies need to develop an early cost-efficient production plan to satisfy those requirements. And to do so, it's worth of looking at pilot program, which allows manufacturing of large at-scale quantities of materials 
using representative equipment and representative process in process development environment, uh, but still create representative material but significantly more cost effective than do it in GMP environment. In addition, looking early and understanding product quality profile can de-risk stability and still allow you to get into the clinical trials with leaner and more straightforward stability program studies. Here in CBM, we're working very closely with our clients to enter, to allow them to enter the clinic, clinic in the most cost-effective way with robust and safe drug products. Because our mission here in CBM is to save lives by accelerating the development and manufacturing of advanced cell and gene therapies. In CBM, we help our partners with all therapeutic modalities from plasmid and RNA to viral vector and cell therapy. We will work with our partners through process development and characterization. We will enable preclinical and commercial manufacturing for them. We can produce most drug substance and drug product here in CBM and ensure we have all proper assays to enable release of both drug substance and drug product batches. And here at this point, I will transfer it to Lynn, who will provide an example how we can support you from drug product perspective and what studies can be performed to make drug product development fast and efficient. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. I'm excited to be able to talk to you about some of the formulation development activities we can do here at CBM using our Unchained Labs equipment to make it very efficient and effective. For an example here, I would talk to you about the AEV9 formulation development. And for this, we use a tiered approach. Tier one being using high throughput screening, using pH and salts. And for that, we use forced degradation studies. And because we're focused on just pH and salts as really having that base case, we could really do a full factorial DOE here. From there, our approach would be then to move into a tier two of this excipient screening. And there you build upon what you learn in tier one. And finally, you'd move to a tier three where you take all your leads from tier one and you can actually get your real time stability and shelf life determined. So when going through this kind of process, as we gain more knowledge, you decrease some of those risks that Tatiana had talked about and help improve the, your possibility of success of moving your product forward. For study design, to give you an idea of how the flow goes, We'd start with the DOE design, really develop your formulations. And from here, once you have your formulations decided, you can actually use the big tuna to do your sample preparation. The big tuna is used for the buffer exchange. This allows us to keep the high concentration AAV that we need to be representative of the product and also enables us to do it efficiently. We can do all the formulations at the same time. From there, you'd move to the junior where you can apply your stress for the force degradation studies and finally move into your analytical evaluation. And there we could use um, multiple techniques. One of them I'll focus on is the stunner from Unchained Labs. So for the example of the tier one evaluation that I'm gonna talk about today, for this, it was actually an AEV9. It came to us in a formulation that we didn't wanna use for the study. So this is where it comes into play using the using the um, big tuna. Uh, our target titer for the study was 2e to the 13th. And so what we wanted to do is that we had basically a, a, what we call a base formulation for the DOE. Here we use the buffer combination that was allowed us to keep the consistent composition throughout the pH range tested. And that's specific for this study because we really wanted to isolate the pH effect. We included a cryoprotectant and surfactant because those are commonly needed, but we kept it consistent so that we can focus on the pH and salt. And we use the pH and salt in the DOE design. You see we use pH 6, 7, and 8 in this study. And for two different salts, we use the high and low concentrations and also a midpoint. And like I said, for each of the formulations, we were able to achieve a change it through the buffer exchange on the big tuna. And this was a significant time savings having this tool in the lab because we were able to load all the samples at the same time and walk away. And you can do very small volumes, just the amount you need for these studies. On this slide, I'll show you the formulations that we actually designed with the DOE. We have the formulation codes listed, which you'll see on the upcoming slides with the results. And you see just the design from the DOE, how that goes through the pH of six, seven, and eight. 
you have either combination of salt, you have either salt one, salt two, the combination, or neither salt. And we also have for one formulation is the midpoint of each. Stress conditions, or in this case, we used uh, time zero, freeze thaw at minus 80 degrees C and ambient. And we use two different temperatures, 25 degrees Celsius and 40 degrees Celsius for different time points. And from these, we come to some of the results that we have from the stunner. In this particular case, I'm just showing you the time zero results. And this is just to give you an example of the type of data that we can get from stunner on the tighter results. We have the total capsid shown in the dark, the dark um, columns full capsid and empty capsid. And you can get all this information from a single read. Now looking at more from what we get from the stability perspective, we look now at all the stress conditions and you can see across the tops your legend showing you that time zero, freeze thaw, 25 degrees C at two and four weeks and 40 degrees C. So then if you look below, the total capsid titer is shown on the y-axis and your formulation codes that we looked at before are shown on the x-axis. From here, you can see that the total capsid titer values were lower in the formulations that were without any salt. In this case, formulations two, six, and 10. Similarly here, we look at the full capsid titer. So last slide was total, here is full. And you see a similar trend. Uh, you'll see again with the formulations without any salt, 2, 6, and 10, had lower titer values. And here you have standard data showing you this, the Z average or size for the, your different formulations after they being incubated, at the, again at the 25 degrees C and 43 and freeze thaw. Here when you're looking at the size, you'll see in formulations 2, 6, and 10 again, the formulations without any salt, you are seeing higher particle size. And also we see that those with only having salt two, which are formulations three, seven, 11, you're also seeing some of the higher particle sizes. If I go to the next slide, I'm just basically zooming in so that you can see more closely um, to the lower numbers. Here, it also enables you to see that the formulations with salt one plus salt two at pH seven, which are formulations nine and 14, are also showing some particle size increase. So I put, by putting all this data together, it allows us to see that we really want to move formulations forward with that have salt one alone. And, and we're going to stick with formulations around pH seven and eight, still evaluating different buffers, crowd protection and surfactants in our next tier. So that would be our first part of our tier two. And from there, we'd also go, well, and besides the thermal and free thaw stress, because we're going to look at surfactants, we're also going to include agitation stress on the junior because you can have the, that done directly on the platform of the junior. From there, you go into the next tier, tier 2B, using the best compositions, and you'll screen other categories of excipients, such as amino acids, chelators, antioxidants, et cetera. And from there, you get your lead formulation compositions. Here's where you'd spend more resources on those more limited number of formulations to determine your final formulation selection and get your real time stability data to give you your shelf life at your intended storage temperature and also the hold conditions that are relevant for your processing and in use stability. Besides doing the AAV9 formulation studies, CBM works with different vectors and can do a multitude of studies for you. So from that, I'd like to turn you over back to Tatiana. Thank you so much, Lynn. And here at CBM, we can uh, help your company to accelerate development of drug products and help to address two major limiting factors that innovative companies very frequently face when they are uh, anticipating or entertaining early product characterization. Those factors are there is never enough time and sample to perform this work. So to overcome those, here in CBM, we propose to use two fully automated robotic capabilities. One of those is the junior automated liquid, ha liquid handler, which allows fast sample preparation in a plate format and allows to completely remove manual pipetting and thus remove potential errors and inconsistency in sample preparation and save significant amount of time. Big 2 maybe for the buffer exchange system allows us to create multiple buffers 
for formulation screening is an example that Lynn has previously shown on his slides and allow us to do this buffer exchange very gently and in a very short period of time. After we prepare all this battery of samples for us to do uh, formulation screening, we are utilizing high throughput analytical assays, including Stunner, which allows us to analyze hundreds of samples very quickly and gain understanding on aggregation or empty flow ratios. We also very frequently utilize Aura, Aura, which is a visible particle instrument, which allows us to get an early insight in the propensity of visible particle formation on microliter scale. SECMOS is the complementary method that we frequently use in addition to Stunner, which also allows us to look at the aggregation of AAVs and some other parameters. And finally, DPCR, the high throughput titering method, allows us to process multiple samples and be able to verify that we are within the titering range that we're targeting for formulation. So by using this high throughput robotic automated capabilities, we allow and help our partners to mitigate their risks. Uh, early on before going to IND and get this early product understanding without spending substantial amount of time and saving their very precious drug product. So what we have covered today is a need for early drug product understanding and characterization, how to achieve it in a time and cost effective manner. In addition to drug product, there are some other selected process optimization studies which can further de-risk your entrance to phase one. Those include performing upstream development studies on the small scale, but also include intermediate scales prior to going to full-scale production. Optimization of the transfer complex strategy is also critical at this stage. For downstream process development, evaluation of dynamic binding capacity is very important, especially if you're dealing with novel capsids as well as understanding of stability of the intermediate during downstream processing is very important as well. In addition to studies that previously were mentioned for drug products, such as the formulation optimization, it is also extremely important to understand the impact of sterile filtration on your drug products and evaluate the total processing time uh, that you have in order to be able to fill your drug substance. In the end, when you design all those studies that I have mentioned, whether in upstream or downstream or in drug product, it is extremely important to utilize the risk-based approach and include the early FMA studies as you're designing the, those um, experiments. In the end, what is important for us and what is important for our partners to make sure that every drop of drug product reaches our patients and our patients are always the first for us. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your presentations. All right, in a few moments, we'll move into our live Q&A session. If you haven't done so already, now is the time to submit your questions for our speakers. Before we begin the Q&A, I'd like to remind you that this webinar will be available to view on demand in the next 24 to 48 hours. So please keep an eye on your email and share the link with your colleagues who might not have been able to tune in today. All right, let's take some questions. Just give us a couple of moments to transition to the live Q&A session. See you soon. And a very warm welcome to the live portion of our Q&A, of our webinar today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, all our speakers are here and ready to take your questions. So just to remind you quickly that if you do have a question, please go ahead and enter it in the ask a question panel on your screen. We're going to be taking live questions for the next several minutes. So please ask your questions now. Thank you once again to all our speakers for being here. All right, I'm gonna jump right in. Uh, we have a few questions already lined up. So let's go ahead and get things started. Um, for the very first question that I have here, uh, I'm actually going to come to you, Kevin. Um, how much AAV do you need to use Stunner? So to use the Stunner, uh, it always takes two microliters of sample, and then the lower limit of concentration that you need for your AAV is about 1 times 10 to the 12th uh, BG per mil. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, this next question is a two-parter. Um, so first part, do I need standards for this assay? And what do I blank with? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take a, the lead on that one again. So uh, for stunner, you don't need standards. You don't need um, to do calibration on plate when you run it. 
Uh, and you can typically just blank with your buffer that you're using or water, depending on the assay that you're using. Um, so it's a very easy assay where you just take the sample that you have and add it to the plate where there's no, no dyes, reagents, or standards. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Um, next question I have, can Stunner be used in GMP? Yeah, so Stunner has a lot of tools that make it easy to translate to a GMP environment. Uh, so it has 21 CFR Part 11 software packages. Uh, it also has IQOQ services, it has uh, performance verification services, and it has um, sort of standards that are uh, that are relevant to the U.S. pharmacopoeia and European pharmacopoeia requirements for for this kind of these kinds of instruments. So all those together make it easy to translate it uh, downstream. Excellent, thank you. And Tatiana, Lynn, did either of you want to jump in on this question? I agree with Kevin. This one. Excellent, thank you both. All right, next question. Um, can you analyze any other viral vectors? Uh, Kevin, why don't we start with you, and then Tatiana, Lynn, if you want to jump in, please go ahead. Yeah, sure. So this uh, application that we looked at today is called AEV Quant. It's one of many applications on Stunner. Uh, so in this case, for viral vectors, uh, you can also do similar kinds of analyses on adenovirus, um, as well as lipid nanoparticles or other viral particles. Um, you know that you want to see size and and absorbance and you know things like protein and nucleic acid concentrations on. Excellent. Excellent. I would like to second that, and we were able to successfully use Tanner on adenovirus, not only for formulation purposes, but also for process development purposes as well. For example, downstream process development, it's found to be a very robust method for, for PD. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And just to remind our audience, we're taking questions live. So if you do have a question, uh, please go ahead and enter it in the Ask a Question panel. We'll try to get through as many as we can uh, on the live today. Um, this next question, does CBM's throughput testing and method correlate with release and stability panels for drug substance and drug product? Um, Tatiana, can we start with you? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, they do. But please keep in mind that um, the work that we cover today, it's really early phase, very frequently preclinical characterizational drug products. At that point, you may or may not have your release and stability analytical panel yet. So the methods, they will definitely be related to this. They be 100% orthogonal, but they may or may not be the same. However, what they will, uh, agree with each other that they will be probing specific, specific critical quality attributes that are important for you to understand that your drug product actually is working and stable as needed. So there will be correlation there, but they may evolve slightly when you come to the full GNP release stability map. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right, I'll keep trucking along with the next question. And thank you to our audience. I see those questions coming in. We're going to get through as many as we can. Um, next question, um, how does, uh, how would CBM's drug product characterization strategy change for late phase programs? Lynn, would you like to take that one? Yeah. Sure, for like, just um, sort of tying into what Tatiana answered for the previous question, um, like for the early stage, you're trying to do the characterization to get an understanding to design. For later stage, we were gonna do, um, we really wanna get more for a robust um, process. And so you're, you're going to do testing that's understanding and helping you set ranges and do things along those lines versus the initial um, testing is for that understanding for the design phase of things. Excellent, thank you so much. All right, next question we have. How how does uh, Stunner's result or how do Stunner's results compare to ELISA and PCR methods? Oh, I, I'll take that one first. Sure, please. Uh, so we have a lot of data on that. Um, so definitely when we're developing Stunner, we focus a lot on orthogonal techniques. Uh, Stunner correlates really really well with uh, you know typical ELISAs. Um, there's one one data set I use all the time, looking at an AEV nine ELISA, where we're seeing R squared values very close to one, slopes very close to one. Um, especially on samples that are, you know, nice and, and monomeric and uh, non-aggregated. Same sort of thing with PCR. PCR is a, a 
you know, a, a sequence specific method and stunner is a non sequence specific method that actually makes them very complementary because in one case you can look very specifically for your, you know, gene of interest. And in the other case, you can go look for how much nucleic acid is in my sample. If those start to disagree, that's telling you something important. Um, but when you have a very nice, uh, say healthy sample, uh, then they correlate very well with each other. Excellent. Excellent. Um, Lynn, Tatiana, did you want to weigh in on this question at all? Right. Go, uh, please go ahead, Tatiana. <laughs> yes, I, I just have to be very clear and make sure what, what the condition of Kevin said, that we're really comparing apples to apples there, right? Uh, Stoner provides much more information than ELISA or PCR. It actually has capabilities of uh, light scattering for aggregation, it has for empty pool. So when you're comparing the methods, you have to be very clear what you're comparing it with. Uh, but we'll say that really using Stoner uh, considering how high throughput and how low volume it is, it allows to answer a lot of questions that all those others essay answering as well. But you need to make sure that you look at the proper data when you compare them, because not every essay can do what actually stomach. can. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right. The next question I have from our audience, is there an upper limit of detection on stunner? Um, practically, no. Uh, Stunner was developed originally in the world of antibody therapeutics, where it's designed to use hundreds of milligram per mil of those samples. So we'll never reach that limit for AAV. Excellent. Thank you so much. And just once again, reminding the audience, we're taking questions live, so please keep them coming. Uh, we're taking, we'll be on here for another few minutes, so please ask your questions. Um, all right, the next one I have. Uh, I would like to know how much percentage loss of the final yield of RAAV in using your process development systems? So I can respond to that specifically yeah. for what we typically see on big tuna. Um, so we see average recoveries are about 96%. It depends a little bit on the behavior of AAV and the buffers that you're using. Um, so it'll, it'll vary based on, you know, serotype. Um, so customers, you know, will typically see that as at equal to or better than their current buffer exchange systems. Excellent. Thank you. And I have another question related to Stunner here, and I think the next couple are related to Stunner. So the first one I have, can Stunner measure M13 phage titer? Okay. So on Stunner, we've developed some applications that sort of do all the math for you, um, specifically for AEV and adenovirus and a few other vectors. For M13 phage titer, there's a few customers that I know of that have already used Stunner for that method, uh, for that, uh, that particle, the virus. Um, and it's kind of a, you figure out the, the outputs, the light scattering outputs that you want to use, and those will correlate with tighter. Um, so it's not something that we have an out of the box application, but we can very easily work with you to develop that method. Excellent. Thank you. Next question. Are there any factors which could cause over-reporting of aggregates on Stunner? Over-reporting of aggregates on Stunner. Um, that's an interesting question. So, uh, probably looking specifically at Stunner's DLS. So for dynamic light scattering, we're going to get a readout on size and size distribution of your sample. Uh, so that's going to be sort of agnostic to what's in your sample. If it's just virus, it'll see all the size and size distribution of your virus. If you have, you know, cellular particles or extra, you know, micelles or things like that in there, um, DLS will see that too. So I would argue that it's important to see everything in, in the sample, um, but it won't be specific to one type of molecule or another. Excellent. And I just want to bring in Tatiana and Lynn, if either of you want to jump in on this question too. Yeah, I agree with Kevin that uh, Stunner will have the same attributes, the same limitations or advantages that other dynamic light scattering has well. If you have, for example, a dust particle in your sample, it's irrelevant whether you do it on Stunner or other DLS instrument, you will see it. So careful sample preparation as critical for Stunner is for every, uh, any other instrument you have out there. And as Kevin said, if those samples also come in from a little bit earlier process steps, yes, they will contain everything else. So you need to account, you need to understand what you're looking for uh, in order to interpret the data correctly, whether it's aggregate or any other component of the system that you have because of the specific unit operation. Excellent, thank you. All right, next question I have. Is the minimal concentration E12 total capsids per ml or vector vector genome per ml? Um, so usually when I say that the lower limit of the concentration 
concentration, I'll, I'll give it in viral genome per mil, just because we know if we have uh, one E12 viral genome per mil, we have at least that many capsids, right? Um, and then that's, that's a limit that if you have a fuller sample, you can go a little bit lower. If you have uh, an emptier sample, like on the order of 10% full, um, then that, you know, one E12 sample is pretty, uh, pretty much where you're gonna get your, your results down to. Excellent, thank you. All right, I have another question related to stunner. Can you use stunner only on purified samples? Ah, so this is a good question. Um, so yeah, we talked about stunner kind of as a formulation development tool in this webinar. Uh, so stunner does all of its analysis best on purified samples. If you have uh, something that's all of the DNA and protein and size of an AAV, it can do all the math that it needs to do. As you move, you know, usually that's something like affinity chromatography or anion exchange chromatography uh, after one of those two steps is usually where you start to see stunner implemented. Um, if you want to go further on uh, upstream in the process, you could still use stunner there. Um, but then what you're going to want to use as an output is things like total amount of DNA, total amount of protein, and then DLS to size and size distribution, and use those kind of um, like individual techniques, and then just know that these are good um, CQAs for your process. So hey, if you're pulling some uh, AAV out of the bioreactor, you'd probably want to know what your total amount of DNA and total amount of protein that you'd expect uh, for a typical, you know, for a typical run is. And just use that as a sort of process control. Don't expect it to be able to uh, separate AAV from, you know, host cell contamination at that point. Excellent. Thank you. And Tatiana, Lynn, did either of you want to weigh in on this one too? Yes. Uh, as Kevin said, that it can be used and we have successfully used it for early uh, unit operations as well. You just need to really understand your system, what you're looking for, and understand what, it, it, what, what the method is capable of doing. You cannot anticipate that the method will be providing the same data from purified drug product, or as Kevin mentioned, it's just a license from bioreactors. So it's definitely very different. A very different solution. Excellent, excellent, thank you. All right, next question I have. Did you do anything to prevent the aggregation of various capsid serotypes in your process development? I'll take this one. Um, so I'm not sure what the the intent of the question is. So for the, when I think of the process development, we're using stunner to monitor as we go. And so they'll, they'll modify conditions to help prevent the aggregation as we go along. And then on the part that I'm always focused on is formulation development. And of course there in our formulations, then we'll add, um, we'll look at different surfactants. Also, as you saw in this particular example, we even provided different salts, salt concentrations all in conjunction with pH that we use to try and um, mitigate any issues with aggregation. Excellent. Thank you. Kevin, Tatiana, do either of you want to touch on this one too? All right. All right. I think we got through through all the questions we have that came in. So thank you so much once again for taking time to answer questions. Um, I appreciate you. And just to remind our audience, this webinar will be available to view on demand in the next 24 to 48 hours. So please keep an eye on your email. You should get a link within that time frame, and you can view the webinar at any time or share it with your colleagues who might not have been able to join us today. So once again, many thanks to Tatiana, Lynn, and Kevin for their presentations and for being here today. Thank you so much. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Unchained Labs. Thank you so much to them. And also like to shout out the Gen Multimedia Group for hosting this event. So special thank you to Liana Jabs, David Mosley, and Hannah Turner. And lastly, but definitely not least, thank you so much to you, our audience, for being here today and for all the great questions. For everyone at Gen, I'm Udwak Thomas. Thank you and goodbye for now. Thank you. Thank you.